The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. We love, love, love the story about David and Goliath. We've been taught that story from the time that we were little kids. This great big giant coming out before the children of Israel as they were in battle against the Philistines. As you look in 1 Samuel chapter 17, it tells us that he came out for 40 days. He challenged, he challenged the children of Israel. Now why, why, why must we go into battle all the time like this? And everybody lose their lives? Let's just settle this right here, right now. Choose you out one man. He and I will fight. If he prevails over me and kills me, then we, the Philistines, will become your servants. But if I kill him, you, the Israelites, you will become our servants. This guy was huge. No doubt he was a very skilled warrior on top of being a very large man. Because when you look into 1 Samuel chapter 17, somewhere around about verse 40, it says that they fled. The children of Israel, an entire army, fled from his presence. How interesting it is that we then find a little boy, well, probably a young man, who comes and he sees the entire scene and he wants to know. What's to be done for the man that, that does this? That kills him in a one-on-one -on -one battle. His brothers, they didn't think too much about it. But as David was looking at the situation, he kept seeing there is a giant. And he keeps coming out and he keeps defying the armies of Israel. Now, folks, what are you going to do about it? You've got this giant in your life, and he keeps pestering you. He keeps poking you. He keeps defying your God. What are you going to do about it? Now, we all have a struggle, don't we? I guarantee you every single one of us has some type of giant struggle in our life. Maybe it is a sin. A sin would we just keep coming back to over and over and over and over again. And it's always because of the same temptation. This little thought over here, this little thing over here, something that we see over here, or a feeling that we're experiencing, we just keep coming back to it. It's something that we have come to crave. You know, maybe there's something physical that we're having to deal with. We consider it to be a giant in our lives. You know, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that was. Maybe it was a physical ailment. Some said that Paul had bad eyesight. Or maybe it was somebody. Somebody is a giant struggle in your life. What kind of giant do you have? Maybe it's a fear. You know, do you have some type of fear? There's something that you fear? I don't like snakes. I don't. I, I don't. I don't even like looking at them in a book. And I turn a page and I see a snake. I'm just stay away from me. And for some reason, I just have in my mind it's going to jump out of the pages of the book and bite me. I have that fear. There's some people have a fear of speaking. Some people have a fear of doing something wrong so they don't do anything at all. Some have a fear of doing something right because once they get it right, then they have responsibility. Challenges are great, they're diverse, they're various. What kind of giant struggle do you have? For 40 days, 
that John has been staring in your face. 80 days that John has been staring in your face. For 120 days that giant has been staring in your face. For 40 years. That giant has been defying the God who has given you a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. Staring you in the face and taunting you. Tempting you discouraging you, filling your mind with doubts, what are you going to do about it? Perhaps the reason why we still have these giants that they won't go away is because we never finish the job. We never make a statement. I want you to take a look. Take a look at verses 50 and 51. David had told Saul, I'll take him. God was with me when I fought the lion, when I fought the bear. God will be with me. And as he stood before that giant, the giant came to him and started taunting him. Am I a dog? Remember the words of David? The words of attack. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. And he reached down into his bag and charged after the Philistine and used that sling and sent that stone right into the man's forehead. Look at verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone the stone sank into his forehead and fell on his face to the ground. Now take a look at verse 50. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. And cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I remember reading this passage over and over and over again years ago. Well, okay, okay, when was Goliath dead? You know, if he killed him with a sling, why did he pick up the sword? So let's just think about this for a second. Why did he do that? The stone sunk into his forehead. He slew him without a sword in his hand. So why did he go stand over the giant and pull out the giant's great big sword and cut off his head? Why did he do it? To make a statement. To finish the job. Do you see what happened after David took the sword? The Philistines fled. The giant, Goliath, was not the only giant in the story. The Philistine armies were too. David needed to finish the job. You can almost imagine the hillside filled with the Philistines as they were looking down as David charges after the giant and that stone sinks into his forehead. Just the, all the, the silence, the questions going on. What just happened? Come on, Goliath, get up. It's just a stone, Goliath. You've got this, Goliath. He's just a little boy, Goliath. Come on, Goliath, get up, Goliath. From a distance, there's no doubt in my mind, the Philistines were looking down and thinking, this man's not dead. He's our champion. He can get up at any minute right now and he will slay that little boy. So what did David do? He clarified the situation. He finished the job. He made a statement. Let's go back to the book of Joshua. 
the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 6 and chapter 7, we find the children of Israel, they're walking around the city of Jericho. And on the seventh day, they had walked around that city 13 times. And they were told, all of the gold and the silver, all the, th- all the good things of the city are to be brought to the Lord, to the treasury. And there was one man by the name of Achan. After the walls had fallen flat and the children of Israel charged into the city, he went thumbing around and he went looking around in the city and he came across a robe, a wedge of gold, and some silver. A little later in chapter 7, he even admits, I covered it and I took it and I hid it under my tent. He did something that he was not supposed to do. What was supposed to be Devoted to the Lord. He took to himself. So the children of Israel, they they don't know what's going on. They go and fight against the city of Ai. A pity little town. Nothing to it. They experienced a great defeat. Joshua and elders, they get down on their hands and their knees. They put ashes on their their head and they want to know what's wrong. Somebody had taken some of the treasure. So Joshua goes tent to tent. I guess you can knock on a tent. Pat on the tent. Wanting to find out where is this treasure? Until finally he comes to Achan's tent and he asks him, Did you do this? So Achan explains the story. Joshua sends some men into the tent. They uncover the tent. They find the treasure there. Everything's been exposed. Everything has been revealed. They found the treasure. Everything is fine, right? Then they take the treasure that Achan had taken, Achan and his family, to the valley of Achor, and there they stoned them and burned the elements and buried them there. If they uncovered the treasure, why did did they stone Achan? They finished the job. They made a statement. Turn forward to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has been immersed. He comes up out of the water. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there He is to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights as He is fasting. Jesus is feasting on God. Satan comes. Matthew gives us the impression that this happens at the end of 40 days after He had fasted. Luke gives us the impression that Satan tempted him the entire 40 days. Luke chapter 4. But at least at the end of the four days, 40 days, there were three temptations. Satan comes to Jesus and tells him, I want you to turn the, this stone into bread. Jesus tells him, man should not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. So Satan comes and he gives him another temptation. He takes him up onto the pinnacle and says, throw yourself down and see if the angels do not scoop you up and save you. And Jesus tells him again, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. And one more time, Satan comes to him and he gives him another temptation. He takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, all of this can be yours if you'll bow down and worship me. Remember what Jesus did? He resisted him another time. He said, it is written. So serve the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. Three times he resisted him. So the question is, why did Jesus then say, go away, get thee hence? Luke tells us that he went away for an, until an opportune time. Satan left his side. 
not there to tempt him. He left because he told him, go away. Why did he tell him to go away? He finished the job. He made a statement. Come forward into Matthew chapter 18, and Jesus is dealing with temptation. Of course, he's speaking in exaggeration, hyperbole, trying to get a point across. If your hand or your foot or your eye causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It would be better for you to enter into life with one hand and, and one foot or, or to be blind than to be cast into the eternal fire. Jesus says you need to identify that temptation that keeps leading you to sin, then you need to cut it off. That should be it, shouldn't it? So why does Jesus say, now you need to throw it away? You need to finish the job. You must make a statement. It's not enough for you to stuff it into a closet. It's not enough for you to put it up in the attic. It's not enough for you to sweep it up under the rug. Jesus says you need to clean it all out. Get rid of it. It's not just a matter of saying, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's moving beyond that and getting completely rid of it. Throwing it out. Making a statement. Now, in a perfect and ideal world, that would all make sense. That we could somehow have a temptation and make a statement. And it would be completely gone. Or that we'd have some physical ailment that we would somehow make a statement and it would just leave us forever. It'd be a perfect and ideal world. We had some fear or some doubt. And we'd just stomp our foot and say, that's it. And it would be gone. But it's not a perfect and ideal world. The temptations are real. The struggles are real. The physical ailments are real. The doubts are real. But I also believe that we can, with faith, with assurance, make a statement. And God will do everything within His power, within His will to be able to help us deal with these giant struggles in our lives. And I truly believe that God wants us to make a statement. So how do we do that? How can you make a statement? Well, the very first thing, and these are just proposals, but the very first thing, attack. Just like David did with the Goliath. You know that that giant has been staring in your face and taunting you and saying, I don't care what you believe in your God. I don't care what he does. I don't care what kind of spirit of power and love and sound mind he's put in you. I'm going to keep taunting you, and I'm going to keep tempting you, and I'm going to keep bringing you and drawing your, you away by your own lust and your own desires, and I'm going to try the best that I can to pull you away from God. So you attack. You take a stand. You expose that sin for what it is. You identify what it is, you cut it off. Attack. Number two, you actually resist the devil. Now, I remember a long time ago thinking back to Jesus while he was in the wilderness after he'd been tempted those three times. Hey, wow. Jesus was, was really able to tell Satan to go away and Satan actually went away? How remarkable is that? 
Of course, it's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Of course He can do that. I don't know why it took me so many years before I finally read it and it, it was clear in my mind. James, the brother of Jesus, says, You resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, have you actually resisted the devil? Now, do you see what Jesus did? He said, Go away. Now, when was the last time that you actually verbally, in the midst of your temptation, recognizing that Satan is trying to pull you away, did you actually say the words, go away, get away from me? Have you ever done that? Give it a try. It's remarkable what those words will be like in your mind and in your heart and with your courage when you actually say those words. Actually resist Him. And then act like you believe it. Oh, He'll be back. He came back at an opportune time against Jesus. But you can actually resist Him and He will flee from your side. Try it. Trust in God's grace. I tell you, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, for me recently, has just... It's been a blessing. Here I see Paul, he has this thorn in the flesh that he has continually prayed about. And God never took it away. But you know what he did do? He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. The love and the compassion, the concern... That gift that you did not deserve. That little thorn in your flesh, it pales in comparison to the greatest gift that I could ever give you. Looking for something to empower your thoughts. If you're looking for something to empower your compassion. If you're looking for something to em empower your strength to overcome your weaknesses, look to the grace of God. You won't find a stronger power that is available for you. A stronger motivation. If you're looking for something to, to bring some cheerfulness, some happiness to your life, some glow, some, some warmth. Look to God's grace, because He always says, My grace is sufficient for you. And it wasn't just to Paul that He says that. He says that to you. He says it to you. He says it to you. He says it to me. Jason, I know you struggle with this, but my grace is sufficient. Instead of leaning on this, lean on my grace. Instead of trusting in this, trust in my grace. Instead of turning to this, turn to my grace. Instead of craving this, crave my grace. My grace is sufficient. Number four, confess your weakness. You know what James said in James chapter 5 and verse 16? Confess your faults one to another. Confess your sins, the English Standard says. Now we do that every time we get together. We offer what we call the invitation of Christ. We ask you to come forward and sit on these pews or go to the back and meet with the elders. In such a, a, a public area, on radio and TV, we're not asking you to 
air out your dirty laundry. As a matter of fact, by the time that we would get to you to pray for you, we would be off the air, not on TV. It won't be on the internet either. You won't find yourself on YouTube. To confess and say that I have a weakness, but my encouragement to you is to find a brother or sister in whom you greatly trust and lean upon them for accountability. Confess your weakness. As Paul said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Last of all, Fill the house. Luke chapter 11, verses 24 to 26. By the providence of God, I came across this passage this week, and I just looked at it and thought, wow, this is great. So go ahead, open your Bibles up. I want you to look at Luke chapter 11, 24 to 26. There are several different lessons that can be learned here. Now, Jesus is te teaching about demonic possession. There is a deeper lesson here, very spiritual, in reference to Jesus' purposes and His church. But there's also a lesson for us here morally, too. There's a moral in this story. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places, the desert places. It's seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Let's try to put it in some different terminology. Man decides that he's going to get rid of the mice that are in his house. And so what he does is he begins to set up traps. And the mice recognize these are traps. This is poison. We've got to get out of here. And so they go out into the field and they start searching for someplace, someplace else to live. But they can't find it. So they come back to the house. While the mice were gone, the homeowner begins sweeping up and cleaning up and tidying up everything. Once the mouse comes back and he sees that everything is clean, he goes out and he finds his friends. Come check this place out. They come back and inhabit the house. That man's probably thinking, I should have gotten a cat. I think there is a real reason why Jesus said, identify the sin, cut it off, and throw it away. Because just cleaning up the house doesn't prevent the temptation, the fear, and the doubt, and the challenges, and the struggles from coming back. Instead, fill your life, fill your soul, fill your heart with things that are good. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, Let him that stole steal no more. He didn't stop with telling him to steal no more. He said, But rather let him work with his hands that he might have so that he can give to those who are in need. Beautiful, beautiful verse on true repentance. Not just stopping what is wrong, but actually then filling the life with what is right. And not just filling the life with what is right, but producing something out of the life that is right. You say, I'm taking a stand. I am resisting you, devil. I am counting on the grace of God. I'm going to... I, Share myself with my brothers and my sisters and count on their support. 
Once I have removed all of that, then I need to fill my life with every amount of good that I possibly can. I'm going to fill the house. That's how I'm going to make a statement. I once did this, but now I'm doing this. It's a higher road. So the question that we end with this morning, will you finish the job? Someone here, you're not a Christian. You've been reading, you've been studying, you believe in God, you believe that Jesus is His Son. You trust that the, the Word of God, it was written by men who were moved by His Holy Spirit. If you were given the chance, you would confess, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Now, finish the job. Make a statement. Make the statement like Jesus did when He was on the cross. He said, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus went down into the grave. You know what you do when repentance to make a statement? You say, it is finished. This whole life is done. I'm through with it. I'm putting it away from me. God, into your hands I am committing my spirit. And so I am going to be buried. I am dying. And when you do, you know what the result is? You will be empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave to stand up and walk in newness of life. Grace of God covering your life. Not because you earn it, because God wanted to give it to you. Or suppose you are a Christian. After being saved, after being transformed, after becoming a brand new baby, you've been walking the Christian life, but you have faltered, and you keep fighting back, and you have faltered, and you keep fighting back, you faltered again, you keep fighting back, until finally you're just exhausted. I just don't know if I could do this anymore. keep going back to the sin over and over and over again. I keep coming back to this temptation. It keeps drawing me away. How can I do it? Make a statement. So we encourage you this morning. Make a statement. And you can do that while we stand and sing this song. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient word.